Okay. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, good afternoon. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. And we welcome everybody, right? So we have um, folks uh, from School 16, right? Where's School 16? John Walton Spencer. Yes, so students from School just the three of you? Or is it more? Proud, proud, proud School 16, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we also have students from Helen Barrett Montgomery, School number 50. Yes, great. And also students from School 58, World of Inquiry. All right, well, thank you, everybody, oh, yeah. for coming. And also greetings to your peers and our colleagues in who are at your school buildings right now because we are live streaming, right, to anybody who wants to see it in the Rochester City School District right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that way we will all be part of this amazing experience. I know Mr. Hilling um, said it was a very special day today, right? Um, it's Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. um, also That's why I wore my red. There, there's some more specialness <laughs> happening today. Does anybody know what else is happening besides Valentine's Day? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Say it. Correct. Today is Frederick Douglass's birthday. And you know what? What? How old he would be if he was still with us? Two hundred. <laughs> it is say it. Two hundred. It is Frederick Douglass's two hundredth birthday today, or would be Frederick Douglass's two hundredth birthday today. And he's pretty special to us because he spent one of the largest chunks of, of time that he lived here in Rochester. And so we remember Frederick Douglass. We honor him as an ancestor because he was a great speaker. He was a great orator, he was a great writer, um, and he stood up for justice and, so, and equality for all people, no mm -hmm. matter how hard it was, and no matter how many people tried to hurt him, and no matter how many people tried to stop him. And so we're, we're blessed to have him as part of our city and to honor him today. Mm -hmm. um, and before we begin, we want to say a big, huge thank you um, to the folks who were involved in bringing Miss Lulu here to us. Thank um, you so much. First of all, so. our, our superintendent couldn't be here today, so she sends her, her regrets, and we're so thankful for her support in moving our district and talking about equity and making that a priority for us. Um, our chief information and technology officer, Anne Marie Lehner, uh, is looking very Valentine's Day today. <laughs> <laughs> right, so thank you so much for your support and the entire instructional technology department. You'll see uh, quite a few of them here. You know, Eileen for helping setting up, and a super huge special thanks to Mr. Pete Hilling um, for really truly doing the monstrous amounts of work here um, to make this happen for us. So thanks very much, Pete, for that. doing so much Mr. on the background. Amen. <laughs> right. And right. our other instructional technology friends, um, we mentioned Eileen, that are here. Uh, who else is here? Oh, Allison, right? And Ms. Leckinger, Mr. Cox, mm -hmm. right? Um, who else? Oh, Jim, right? Oh, and Ryan, th thank you very much, Ryan, uh, for, for coming over. Um, and there will be a few other folks stopping in, too. You'll get to see our deputy superintendent, um, Dr. Guillory, and our other deputy superintendent, superintendent excuse me, deputy superintendent, Bill Wright, also stop in. And also a huge thanks to the communications department, Mr. Todd Hall and Mercedes Uluzuski, who, who just logged in, who are helping with the streaming today. Right? So um, just a quick note, I know you've already been talking with, with Ms. Griffin, um, but I mentioned that today is a very special day to have, uh, because it's, it's Frederick Douglass's birthday, right? And so we carry on his legacy, and we honor him particular in today and celebrate his life and legacy by talking with a great person who stood up for what is right, Miss mm -hmm. um, Lily Westbrook Griffin, right? Okay. Griffin, excuse me. Yeah. And so we're so thankful and lucky to have her here today because we get to hear your story directly from you, mm -hmm. uh, and we're thankful to hear from you. Thank you. Right, so thank you so much for being here, and it was so great to see you again. Do uh, likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Well, good morning again, young people. My, uh, thank you, Pete, for, for, you know, I got up very early this morning. Uh, it took me an hour to get here. And on my way here, I was thinking, what can I say to you young people? The thought came to me is to share my story with you in the eyes, through the eyes of a 12-year-old. When I was born, I was born in America's Georgia, which is a southwest town, tucked in somewhere around Atlanta, Plains, former President Jimmy Carter. I lived 10 miles from his hometown, and he was the one that would sign the high school diplomas in our school district, except that I didn't finish school there. I finished school up here in Rochester. At the age of 12, I was arrested, and I was taken to a stockade about 30 miles from my hometown. The stockade was in a little town called Leesburg, Georgia. And the stockade had been used since 1812 during the war because they had bars on the windows. 
That was a dilapidated toilet there. There was no beds, nothing comfortable. Everything was nasty and full of debris. And myself and 32 other young ladies was taken to that place off the street after we had been protesting against segregation and the Jim Crow laws. I was kept in this place for 45 days, July 1963, at the age of 12. Lulu and the Girls of America's Georgia, 1963, is an original and untold story of young people, some barely out of elementary school, answering the call for freedom. My name is Lulu Westbrooks Griffin. I, along with my brother James Westbrooks, and these Gloria Brie Love, and other young people in our small town of America's Georgia, challenged the Jim Crow laws and protested against racism. After a major demonstration in the summer of 1963, 32 of us girls ended up in the Leesburg Stockade, which was an old abandoned Civil War prison. We were held there for 45 days. The conditions were horrible and some of us were abused. We will get reflections from some noted civil rights leaders who taught us and inspired us when we were young, including Julian Bond and Representative John Lewis. This is an emotional and inspiring civil rights story never before seen on television or on the civil screen. This is a story of young people who risked their lives to be free. It is a universal story young and old must see. It is a story relevant today, 40 years later. Keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up the freedom land. Ain't gonna let your guns turn you around, turn you around, turn you around. Ain't gonna let your guns turn you around. Keep on walking, keep on. Okay, as you can see, the three-minute trailer is just a snapshot of what we was doing as we protest. I just want to back up a little bit. At the age of 10, I remember reading signs that was very blatant as I went through my town, different places. I wasn't aware that I was born in the segregation but these signs was everywhere, you know, like signs, white drinking fountain only, which you saw in the little snippet of the documentary. Signs like colors, use the back door. Those signs was behind the buildings with hands pointing, white hands, not in a particular hand, but it was painted white. Signs like no, um, you can't not eat here. No Negroes alive. You must stand in a separate line. These was very blatant laws that we had to abide by living in the United States of America in 1963. Well, my teachers and my parents was like hand in hand teaching us that there's a better life beyond these signs that you see. We would go to the classroom, and it reminded me of something like this because I believe the teachers started schools without walls when I was a kid, simply because if you was in the third, fourth, or fifth grade, one teacher would have a classroom with each one of those grades to teach. And our classroom did not consist of modern day technology, chairs, we would have these hard wooden chairs with 
desk that um, with Rickley, two students would have to sit at the same desk and you would have to share that wooden desk for your writing, for everything you did in the classroom. We did not resent our teachers from what they taught us because they were like second parents to us. And we knew that these laws that had spurned from the colonial times that was telling us that we were two-fifths of a citizen and we would not matter to us. Even though Abraham Lincoln had supposedly freed the slave in 1863, but in 1963, 100 years later, colored children, I'm, using, I'm looking through the eyes of a 12-year-old girl. I'm telling my story as a 12-year-old saw it. We were supposedly had been freed through the Emancipation Proclamation, but that was not so because the Jim Crow laws was very, very prevalent on the books in the South, and it was unconstitutional. We were living like a third world country where you had no one to fend for you. You was accused of things because of the color of your skin. You were disrespected because of the color of your skin. And we were separated in the town by railroad track. On the north side of town, the colored people lived. And on the south side, the white people lived. I can remember my mother going out every day to work in a white person's home. She would do their laundry, she would cook their food, and anything was left over, she would bring it home to her children. I am the youngest of nine children. My mother took on the responsibility of teaching us not only at home, but she would tell us that you are a special person. And when we get to school, the teachers would tell us the same thing. So after watching all this hatred and signs like this and small signs that had uh, water fountain, was over the water fountain for colored people, the big signs was over the big water fountain for the whites. So one day I was uptown with my mom and I asked her, I said, Mom, what does white water taste like coming from a 10-year-old? My mother would take my hand and snatch me and say, come on, let's go. She never would explain things to me. So I thought maybe I should pay more attention to the news of what was going on in the state of Alabama with all the dogs and the water hoses and people that were being trumped up charges against them. There was nothing that the colored man couldn't get away with because it was like we was on their uh, radar, even little kids. You couldn't go to the playgrounds. You couldn't ride the public transportation. You did not have books from your school, you would get books from the white kids' school the year before, and their names would be in the books. The pages would be torn. We would have to take, take tape, bind the books together, seal the pages so that we can read them, but yet we could not go in the only library in town because of the color of our skin. These laws barred, it us, barred us from being the best that we can be. So at this time, I was listening to Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King as he was coming through Alabama and the speeches he was making, and I was learning about Emmett Till and how he had been killed at the age of 14 because he didn't understand the customs of the South, that you don't talk to white people. He was from Chicago. And when he came down to Mississippi, I had read about this, that he had gone to a store on a dare where this colored boy had told him, I bet you, you won't say anything to that white girl. And he said, why not? So when they left the store, he said, bye, baby. A week later, Emmett Till was missing. 
And his grandfather had gone for help to see if anybody can help him. These are the things I was listening to. I also remember hearing about Rosa Parks, how she refused to give her seat to a white male passenger. I was a 10-year-old girl, and I was hearing all this atrocity, everything that was coming upon us without a cause because of the color of our skin, because these laws had been on the books, and they had barred us from being citizens. And we was at the lower end of the totem pole. We couldn't go in restaurants you, unless you worked there. You couldn't go to banks. They had no black tellers. They had nothing that would help color people other than the fact that you can go in the white man's field and pick cotton, peaches, or that would be your daily living. What, maybe five bucks a week for a grown man to feed his family. I got sick of listening to the way they was treating grown people, the young white boys would call older colored men boy. They didn't have no name. They disrespected them. During the night and the wee hours of the morning, you would hear where the KKK had burned crosses on colored people's yard. They would rouse these older men up out of the bed three or four o'clock in the morning, saying that they had been raping their children. There was all kinds of trumped up charges against colored people. Well, we started to think, how can we change the system? Because being the youngest of nine children, I had a brother that had just began to go into college at Fort Valley State University College. To have him come home and told him, the only good job for you, boy, is to shine white folks' shoes. They didn't know my brother because he was the president of his class. He was on the football team. And he was a very, very smart young man. So when he did find out, there's got to be something we can do. He took me to a mass meeting when he found out there was a mass meeting coming to town. And this mass meeting was in a funeral home because that was our own refuge. You know, we couldn't come together and have meetings knowing that we were plotting and planning how we were going to march and demonstrate our way of life to the, the segregation signs. Anyways, um, we had been going to mass meetings. Eventually, we would have these mass meetings in churches because the churches was our refuge. Oh, yes. I went to Sunday school. I knew all about the Bible. I had teachers that would go hand in hand with my parents, and they would tell me that you have greatness in you. You can change things. Your voice has to be heard. I didn't understand that until after a couple of years that I had gone to mass meetings. I listened to the freedom speakers, listened to the freedom songs. We made our signs, like justice signs, that would tell us we can carry these signs, like peace signs we would make. We would make signs that would say equality. I wasn't sure what I was doing at the time, but these signs are the things we carry while we protest type of signs. We did not do a lot of talking. We would sing our freedom songs, oh, freedom. Oh, oh, freedom. We would sing those songs as we walking. Oh, oh, freedom over me, over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Those songs we would sing. So this particular day, I had gone to a mass meeting and we was told, eventually, you're going to go to jail. They would teach us how to protect ourselves just in case they would come upon us with their billy clubs, their water hose, their dogs. They had them all. They had the irons, the prodding irons that they would shoot animals with and step back, electrical charge on them. They would use these on kids to make us stand back. But this one day, we had filed out of the church, and we were going towards the Martin Theater. 
this was the day of reckoning for me. I was 12 years old. I was in a group, a lot of students that came off campus. They were running, getting in the line to protest. Anyone could not march in those marches. You had to take, a, take an oath of nonviolence, which we did. We were told that if we go do a sit-in, you would sit there no matter what they did to you. You was there for a purpose. We were trained that if somebody light a cigarette, blow the smoke in your face, you didn't retaliate. Sometimes they'll take a bowl of sugar, dump it on your head to try to get you to get up from the counter. Maybe take ketchup and squirt it on you. But you sat there because you had a purpose to break those laws of segregation. I was very afraid when I saw these real tall state troopers, KKK members that would be police officers during the day. At night, they would be the one that would rouse you up out of your bed, or they would keep fire going on your lawn. I was afraid, but I knew I could not change my mind. At that moment, we walked closer to the theater, right at the end of the driveway there at the road. And all I remember hearing was, stop, disperse, or you're going to be arrested. And they had billy clubs, they had dogs, they had fire hoses, they had everything. And yet we did not stop with our signs. We kept walking and singing. When we got so close to them, we kneeled down to pray. And they were swinging their billy clubs trying to get us to get up. They were using fire hoses. And if you know what a water hose would do when you see uh, somebody just using a simple water hose in a driveway and there's debris, everything just popping around, leaves or whatever. These were fire hoses from the fire department that would definitely knock kids down. Skin, they take the skin off you, they were so forceful. And I remember being hit over the head, that's why the little scarf is there. They were swinging so hard, um, taking us by our feet and our arms and just swinging us and throwing us in the back of a. Bars on the window, the back door, no air that you can breathe. And they threw all of us kids in there. And the next thing I know, I was on my way to the Leesburg Stockade. As we was gone and gathered in the Leesburg Stockade, oh, you see it. Word was being used all the time all the time. We didn't have proper names in our town. We was always called that in, that in, that. And all these things were making me stronger to know I'm going to go in the stockade, but I tell you what, I'm not going to let them break my spirit. So we was pushed in the stockade. There was no beds, no blankets, no Nothing for hygiene. We went in there. I had a blood coming down my face where the cop had hit me, and I asked if I could get medical help. He said no. I told him I wanted to talk to my mother. He, they said no, so they pushed us and shoved us in there, right to the cold, hard concrete floor, all of us girls, and we was crying. We was screaming and crying. But in the meantime, we had to get control of ourselves because we was on a mission. And I knew when I went in there that I was going to be arrested because they had told us that. So after maybe a couple of days in the stockade, we hadn't heard from our parents. They didn't know where we were. Um, they brought us a hamburger in a little boxes. The, the, the buns was very hard. The meat, you break it apart, it was red. There was no condiments, no nothing on your hamburger. And they would just shove them to us like we were animals. 
And they said to us that if you try to escape, Dr. King is not going to be your savior. We will kill you. We weren't trained to be held in the stockade for 45 days, but we was in there for 45 days. There was a shower that leaked warm water constantly. We couldn't control the shower. The water was warm. It was in July. The temperature would get up to be 100. At night, the bars on the windows was broken out, the glass. The mosquitoes and the cockroaches would come in at night, and they would crawl all of us, all over us. The walls would be sweating from the smell and the stench of the place. Eventually, we had to release ourselves and we would go to this dilapidated toilet and release yourself. You go to the shower, you put your hands up like this to drink the hot water. Uh, we had the same clothes on that we went in as two or three days had gone by. We had no hope in our parents knowing where we were. I wasn't taught to walk out of the house of the yard of my parents without their permission. We was under the hands of the Ku Klux Klan that had taken advantage of us. And we was there for 45 days. Um, eventually, someone came along and they threw a rattlesnake in the bar, inside the bar. Um, we was already suffering from the bruises, from laying on the hard concrete floor. We had scrapes and bruises. Some of us was filled with mucus from the stench. I used to suffer with ear aches and scratches was all over us. And we would pray and we would sing our freedom songs. We would look to one another for strength. And we was trained, but we weren't trained to be in such an inhumane condition. 10-year-old. 11-year-old and 12-year-old girls, maybe 14-year-old girl, which she wanted to be in charge of everything. And it's no wonder because she ended up being a uh, narcotic agent later on in the years. But the stockade for me was um, a horrible place. And we would pray. We would sing our freedom songs. We would wish for the things that, oh, are so comforting, like your bed, your mama's cooking, your grandmother's cooking. We went through a lot of stuff in our minds, but we didn't have proper representation. So we was there, finally, until Dan and Lyon from, he was, uh, okay, Dan and Lyon was a photographer student that had heard. Someone at the SCLC office that these young girls was taken away and they were hidden in this stockade. Um, later on, uh, these things I'm saying now because I met Dan and Lyon as an adult and he was telling me the things that who was working on the outside trying to get us released. And it certainly was our parents because our parents worked for the white folks and they was afraid. I'm my mother's baby daughter. She had no idea where I was. Um, when he did come to take pictures of it, us in the stockade, um, he set a camera, which is not like the modern day cameras, right at the base of the window. And he said his hand was shaking like this, taking pictures, because he was told to come there and take pictures, not of us, but the condition that we were living in, which was squalor conditions. There were feces had piled up in the sink, drain. We had no change of clothes. The young women had started their, um, you know, a little, got a little more mature in there, and we was wretched. Um, I remember one girl was screaming every night because the rattlesnake that had been in there, they had taken them out, but she was having nightmares, and it was so sad. But after he came, I said a week later, we was taken out of the stockade back to America's jail, the same way we went in. My school had begun, and um, I remember taking, going to the health department with all these girls, 
and they gave us a shot with the same needle. Everybody got a shot with the same needle. And we went right to school the next day. I had no social, no psychologist or, there was no one there that could help me, you know, ration out my mind. We had bouts of crying all the time. And all these things happened to us just because we stood up for what we believed in and we wanted to make a difference. Um, the difference that we made, and I'm skipping around a little bit because I'd rather, if you guys have any questions, please ask me. You can stop and raise your hand uh, right now. Yes. You, you have to speak up, dear. And if I, oh no. Oh no, we got along because some of us was related, some of us went to the same school and we lived in the same neighborhood. Because you have to remember, at that time, colored kids went to school with colored kids. There was no busing, there was nothing like that. We were trained, we were trained, we were trained to uh, stay calm. We were trained to protect ourselves. You know, they would teach us how to lay on your side with your knees in a fetal position and you cover your head just in case someone come with the bat or whatever. And we were beaten. I mean, it was a really horrible situation. But the reason for that is someone, and we believe that someone took advantage of that because the reason we wanted to change the laws because they were so blatant. Um, you guys have no idea what born in the segregation is like. You don't, you don't know what it's like for somebody to not like you in your whole town because you, your skin color is different. Now, not all white people were like that, don't get me wrong, because there was a lot of them that really cared about the colored people, but they was afraid to speak up. And you know, when they did speak up, they would call them the and lovers, y'all get the message? Okay, but we didn't fight. We was praying, we had gone to Sunday school, we knew how to read the Bible, we had a lot of faith, we had good teachers and good leaders. Our parents were good loving citizens and they wanted what was best for us. We were gone whole, they could not change us. We were changing the whole scenario of what had been since the 1800s, those colonial laws. And what I'm saying, young people, anybody got a question? Yes. Was there more than one cell? Pardon me? Was there more than one cell in the, in the jail? Well, actually, where we were, no. It was just one big room, you know, with bars on the window. But we were at another jail before we came there. And all the jails were full. Even in America, the jails were full. They even had makeshift jails because they even used a part of an old post office to make jails, and one of the guys in my class broke out and got, I don't know what happened to him, but when I went down there 20 years ago, he was the sheriff. You know, it's amazing how if you stand for something that nobody can't indoctrinate, indoctrinate your beliefs and your feelings, you have to have those feelings for yourself because every one of you Young people in here, you're flawed, we all are. But there's greatness inside of all of you. And you don't have to be a certain age to make a difference. Most of the time, young people have a good, strong mind, and they fear that if they speak up, they're gonna be ostracized. But one voice can make a difference. And we bonded together to say, no more books from the white kids' school with their names in them. No more having my parents to get on a bus with the dime and put the dime in the front, get on there and put the dime inside of the thing. And then they got to get off and walk back to the back of the bus and get back on in the back so the white man can have a seat. You know, all these things were happening. Little kids driving their bicycles around. If they cross the railroad tracks, the white kids would send their big dogs on them and there was so much going on. It was a very, very tough time for me as a young girl. It was turbulent times. But my 
hope was that whatever we did, we was hoping that it would spill over in the generation to come. It wasn't just us trying to make things happen and we weren't fighting an organ in the town. We were really sincere. We were very gun ho with changing those laws that young people like you coming along can have the right to vote. Colored folks can vote. They had all kinds of perks, uh, all kinds of things for colored people. They would set jars of sand. You had to guess how many grains of sand in this jar before you can vote. They had all kinds of things for colored folks to fail. But because you had a generation of young people that say, we will no longer stand and let these laws keep us from being the best we can be, we took that stand. We went to jail. People was killed. They had freedom riders that would come from different places, and the buses were bombed. People lost their lives so that we all could be free, so that we could live in peace and harmony, have that spirit of a dream that Dr. King had talked about. Um, it was a time where so much was going on. They had the Black Panther movement going on. There was uh, the President of the United States later on was assassinated. And Juan Sadat was assassinated. Um, I, I, it was just horrible for me as a young person, but I knew that once I get involved in something, I couldn't quit. So being in jail was a badge of honor rather than a jailbird thing. You know, I didn't keep going to jail after that. I had to go to school. You know, it wasn't like that. We weren't on drugs. We weren't having sex. We were not thinking about boys or whatever. We were serious about changing those laws to make a difference. And it did help. It really did. Because when you think about how long you have to live in a place at the age of 12, I, wasn't, I didn't have a voice to go out and stand against these people. My action spoke for itself. You know, the signs we carried. Every time they had a mass meeting, I was there. Any time they were protesting, I was there. All of us was there. But our lives were so, so sad. When you look at your parents and your grandparents and people disrespect your parents and your children, and your children had to stay in the child's place. You couldn't say, well, I'm going to do so and so and so because they did this to my parent. No. If your parent tells you something, you obeyed. If your teacher told you something, you obeyed. You did not rise up. I don't believe in a child that I went to school with, I don't believe ever disrespected their parents or their teachers. They always had some kind of respect because these parents was poor. They didn't even, I didn't even know I was poor until somebody told me. You know, I used to wear those little white sneakers with no sole on the, on the bottom and hand me down clothes for my sisters. And, um, but we loved our life. It, in a way, it was a little better then than it is now, because the protests are now. Yes, Pete. I just wanted to say these students, and I. Sorry to interrupt. That's they all right. Have a ton of questions. Well, I'm going to. But I know that they. So if, do not hesitate raising your hand and asking your question. You can yeah. plan into this. So feel free. Okay, that's a good point because if I'm leaving something out, I, I'm writing too. So it's everything is sort of. Who has questions? Yes, and speak up loudly, okay? What gives you the strength to keep living through the stockade for the 45 days? Oh, that's a good question. The training I had, first of all, and everything started at home, dear. You know, we had a foundation at home. You know, you, it wasn't like the, the family now, you go live here and there, but my mother was in the family, my stepfather, my real father died when I was two years old, and we had a community that cared about each other. You know, even though we was in the same boat, everybody cared. So we had the strength from, and the love of our parents, the teachers, the community. And above all, we had faith and we knew what it was going to take. You don't, you don't start something and quit. That's a good question. Anyone else? Yes. Um, after you got out of the stocking, um, did you learn anything? Now, you got to get a little more specific than that. What kind of lessons did I learn? Yeah, like, 
like that you would carry on in life to use them? Oh, well, um, you have to remember, like I said, I was 12 years old when I got out. We had to go to school. And we couldn't tell anyone what was going on. Everybody knew what was going on. They knew we was in jail. They knew how evil everything was. And you didn't have, um, you didn't have school sociologists and psychologists. And you didn't have any of that stuff to help you articulate your feelings. You know, so we had to go right into our books. And um, after a couple of years, my parents left there and we moved to New York because it seemed like it was getting worse. And better, but I learned more as I became an adult about what was going on. Anyone else got a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, after you were released, were you still able to live life as a kid, or were you like kind of forced to grow up a little bit faster? Oh no, I we lived the life as a kid. You kids did what they were told, and you know we we didn't speak out like y'all do now. You know, y'all got big mouth, and forgive me for saying this, but y'all tell people off in a minute, your teachers and everybody else, even your friends. And we didn't have social media either, so you did what you were told to do, and there was no other way. You know, you didn't argue with that. Teachers and principals was like parents to us, and uh, they knew what was best for us, and uh, we just had a regular kid's life. Uh, to me, it was good. I don't know. It was the laws that really... Uh, kept us in place, so to speak. So we, we continue to live as a child should live. Any more questions? Yes. You, you, you know what, you need to speak up just a little bit because this ear is not that great. After the assassination, did it, like, the way black people were treated, was it, like, fast, like, intentional, or did it take time to progress? Did it improve, do you mean? Yeah, did it improve fast? After the assassination of, uh, well, you know what, when Dr. King was assassinated, I was living in New York State, because I, I left there, but, um, that, yeah, that was assassinations, but usually the person that was assassinated the ones that spoke out the loudest, you know, like Martin Luther King, Anwar Sadat, you know, President uh, Kennedy, and those that stood, and Mal uh, Malcolm X, and um, what, what was his name, the one in Mississippi that was killed in his... Evers? Yes, Mega Evers. He was speaking out at the college he was in, and he was going down right in his driveway. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of people that was assassinated, but they were people that really was for everyone. They was humanitarian. It wasn't just like someone went and got a gun and said, well, you know, I'm going to kill him. Because when they see change, people are afraid of changes, you know. So that's, to me, that was just something that was just going on because there was those people that didn't want to see people come together and they didn't like what they had to say. Um, but it was turbulent for me, being a 12-year-old girl, and all these things were happening. Even when I got out of high school and the Vietnam War was going on, I had friends that were 17 and 18-year-old colored boys going to Vietnam, and they were feeling like, why should we go to war in fact, the white man's war, and they don't care nothing about us here. So, you know, that was another tough thing for young colored people. And that word color was the, the terminology of the identity that we would, that they would describe us. Did anyone have any more questions? Yes. Um, when you were doing protests and people were treating you violently, was it hard to respond in a nonviolent way and kind of keep it? together while they were being so disrespectful? Well, if you was in a demonstration or protest march, you, you would stay true to the oath you took because that was always sidelined. Matter of fact, let me read this poem I wrote real quick. Uh, this is something I wrote from that era. America, Georgia in 63. There was obvious signs of bigotry. Laws of segregation were everywhere. White supremacist groups 
did not care. The hated, they hated the people of color, and it was blatant and vicious towards my sisters and brothers. There were perpetrators, spectators, instigators, violators, vigilantes, agitators, KKKs, and Negro haters. We marched with our play cards and sang freedom songs. We were being in jail while making history at home. Men had fought for their freedom to change the Jim Crow laws. Now America, Georgia has no signs of segregation, but liberty and no more segregated walls. I wrote that. Um, to answer that question too, thank you. Y'all can have a copy if you want. <laughs> and, and another thing, young lady, um, I had some experience with white kids, though, after, th after that. I can remember um, I went down with my sisters to pay a bill for my mother at the electric company. And I knew how to drive. Um, and I was back in the car out, and I heard this white girl say, you better not hit me, you blatant N. She used the N word. And I, she scared me. I got out and looked, and I was nowhere near her. And she came around and kicked me so hard right in the shin of my leg. And I reached for her. Well, somebody took my hand like that and said, don't do that. So, yeah. so there was a lot of little things that we, I was spit on. Um, I, my glasses were taken off and thrown. So there was many little inst instances where people would antagonize you. But for the most part, um, after 16, I was not living in Georgia. I came up to New York at the age of 16, and I continued my education. I never could understand that. That's why I studied psychology. I never could understand how people could be so blatant and mean, and that was what I studied. Um, and I don't hate anyone. I never had that feeling of hatred. Did someone have a question over here? No more questions. Yeah, at, at, at what point did you know you had participated in something that was historic? Because you were in America's Georgia, you're 12 years old, and this thing happens. At, at what point in your life did you realize that you had that you had played this part in something very large and very sweeping that that, that resulted in massive change uh, and, you know, over time? At what point did you sense that this was an historical thing that you had participated in? Um, after, after I was up here, I went back down, I believe, in 1970 to a high school reunion. And the, middle, the school that I had attended, ninth grade, the last time, they had a thing in the yard, like a post with a plaque on it, saying that this was a high school and it's no longer a high school because the Ku Klux Klan bombed it when it was going to be integrated. So the, the day or two before it was going to be integrated, they bombed the school. So things like that, um, the fact that people was signing up the boat, the fact that I saw buses coming in the neighborhoods where I used to live, was picking up colored and white kids in that area. And I thought, wow, that's different. But just little things, you know, I noticed. Um, and um, some of the girls, guys, were dating a little bit in school. And some of the white kids and black kids became friends. And, uh, but, you know, it was totally different because there was no social media. That, you know, everything you did, you did it honestly, face to face, you know. And uh, so, yes, ma'am. Um, you said um, earlier. That when you came back from school, how did the kids teach you? Because you said that they knew what was going on. How did they teach you when you came back? Well, uh, one thing, sure, they weren't calling me a jailbird because it was a lot of them in jail, too. And um, they didn't treat me any differently from the way it was before because we were all sort of in the same boat. And we didn't have legal representation to say, well, you know, I'm going to get a lawyer because these people hurt me or I came out bruised up or y y who you going to tell? Everybody knew what was going on. So we were still friends, you know, and 
families. Uh, we had a wonderful community, even though we was poor, but we, we still love everybody. Everybody raised everybody's kids. It wasn't, I never heard of latchkey kids until New York State had that, because that was always someone to watch you, your older sisters, your aunts, your grandmother, we, everybody lived together, you know, and look out for one another. So it wasn't bad. The only thing that was bad was these laws that was keeping us from having the full, you know, statue or status of being a citizen in our town. It was hard when you think about looking back at it. It was very difficult because I never could understand that mentality of why people would treat you so blatant hatred and they don't even know you. Um, yes. Same, 1963, same year. I just was in there for a couple months almost. For all the summer, and when the kids, when kids was outside playing and having a good time, we were locked up. And I mean, the walls of the stockade would be sweating from the stench, from the building up or waste, from the heat. Um, it, it, it was just horrible. It was a horrible situation. But if you ask me, would you do it again? Would you go to that thing again and do that? I probably would say yes. You know why? Because I know that I lost my innocence then, but it made me a better person. It made me realize that people are equal. They should be treated equal. God made everybody, and there's greatness in everyone. Uh, there's, like I said, we are somewhat flawed, but every one of you young people in here can contribute something to society. Um, it doesn't matter, even if you're the only one in your classroom that stand up for somebody that bullying you. Because if you don't stand up for what you believe in, you're going to fall for anything. And we had a mindset that we were going to stick together and we were going to change the society. And it did change. Now, people have asked me, if Dr. King was alive today, what would he say to our society. Now, now, can somebody answer that for me? If you, if, I know you didn't know him, and I know you didn't know the times that were, but if Dr. King asked the question, um, young people, do you, do you know anything about the civil rights movement as far as people putting their lives on the line? What they went through? Huh? No? I know you do, Pete. <laughs> they do too. I do too. I, well, I'm waiting for somebody to respond. Yes. Yes. So maybe you're saying, how are things now? Well, okay. How are better as a no, wait a minute. That, you know what? If Dr. King was in this room uh -huh. and he said, you know what he would ask? Where have we gone wrong? You know, he put it, he was a humanitarian, but. See, a lot of people think that Dr. King was just for the colored people. That's not true. He was a humanitarian. He was for everybody, everybody that was poor. The worst people that I ever heard of during that time was people living in the Appalachian Mountains. In the Appalachians, that no running water, um, no lights. Poor, and a lot of them white people, poor whites. And he was standing up for their rights. He was standing up for the right to vote, the right to change the system. And we have to continue that dream because if we don't have a dream where we're going to make something better for everyone, we're doomed to fail and we're going to repeat history again. Now, even the demonstrations and the marches are totally different from when I used to go out and demonstrate and march. Our signs would speak for us. And sometimes you'll see that in a company where people are protesting outside and they're walking around real quiet, they're not saying anything, they just got their signs up, protesting. You guys see that sometimes, right? They're not fighting amongst themselves. Now, when you see a situation like Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, where someone may have gotten shot by a cop or whatever, and then the whole town come out and you got people coming from other counties that perpetrating and violence, burning up cars and burning up stores. 
Why would anyone want to destroy their community? That don't make sense, right? We, we weren't doing that. What we was doing is making sure that these Jim Crow laws going to come off the books in the year 1963 in America, this beautiful, great country of ours. We're not in a third world country. Someone had to go to jail. Someone got killed. It's just like the wars we had prior to the war we have having now. World War I, World War II, War 1812. Those people put their lives on the line so that America would be free. And those things have constantly been going on and on, whether it's standing up for civil rights, human rights. I mean, everybody got rights. Not even dog animals got rights. I mean, you, you can't even hit a dog or spank a cat or whatever unless you go to jail. And to me, I think people are more important than that. But the, the rights that we are perpetrating on people nowadays, just it doesn't sound right, but that's, that's a whole other thing. Uh, um, and this is another poem I wrote. Because I can remember in my classroom, I had teachers that, some of them were my Sunday school teacher. Some of them was music teachers. And we had a glee club at the school. And I remember crying after I got out of high school. And I wrote, I have a whole manuscript of poems. But this one is called B, B-E. And it goes like this. I never resented sound truth where parents and teachers met all the values and principles installed in me. I won't ever forget. You can be anything you want to be was all I ever heard. No matter how tough my classes seem, that was my teacher's favorite word. Often mom would say in words so soft to me, my dear, daughter, girl, you can be whatever you want to be. Not only in America, not, excuse me, not only because in America you can see what you want to see, but what more importantly in our democracy is you can be what you choose to be. Now how great is that? You understand? <laughs> now, Anyone else have a question before I sing? I'm going to send you all a song. <laughs> yes, sir. First of all, I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping you're kind of an emotional wreck, but I'll try to get through the question. Oh, that's all right. Take your time. Um, and how can you speak to our kids here the nonviolent message and approach that you all took to such a hyper violent? environment that our kids grow up in from our present administration uh, to media and music that promotes the best response mm -hmm. is a violent response to if you disagree with me or disrespect me or on the response that I've seen in a lot of our children mm -hmm. is a violent response. Mm -hmm. Yes. You still maintain your your focus and saw the bigger picture. How can you translate your message 1963 to 50 years ago? 19, yeah, to 2018, mm -hmm. where outside of a rally of present administration, it looks like the Jim Crow South again. How can you translate? That? That's a good question. First of all, <clears throat> everything, I, I should say every person, need a foundation. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. Now, my foundation was there was two parents always in the home. They always told, told you what was right. They took us to Sunday school. They read the Bible. That's what we got our most important faith from through whatever the Bible would say. My parents would tell us that God loved us, that he 
made all of us here for a purpose. We're here for a purpose, you know. You're not just sitting, sitting here to wear sneakers and hair up real high or, you know, wear different clothing that might make somebody envy you. We're here for a purpose, all of us are great within. Someone has to tell you in your home, you got to start out with the foundation where a mother, even if it's not a father in the home, maybe it is a father, not a mother. But that person has to be the role model to tell you, okay, everything, which my mother would say and the teacher would say to us, everything started at home and it spreads abroad. So you can't just grow up in a, situ a culture like this without any kind of teaching, with any kind of strength, without any kind of support, without any kind of education. The only thing that I see in that case, uh, uh, dear, is that the home has been broken. And I feel bad for kids in this culture because they have been indoctrinated by Hollywood, first of all, by these magazine, teen magazine, and different magazines make you feel like, well, if you ain't scanning enough, you, you know, you, you don't fit. I was under the impression that if you got blue eyes and blonde hair, that's what epitomizes what beauty is. Oh, that's not true, because anybody can dye your hair blonde, but you can't change or legislate the heart. That has to come from within. That has to be something that is a character of the person. And it's just like a pond. If you took a stone and you threw a stone into a pond, what are you going to get? Who can tell me? You're going to get a ripple. Who said that? That's right. You're going to get a ripple effect, OK? And it's going to keep on going out. Now, I say, said that to say this. If there's no one in your life, in these kids' life, and I believe teachers and educators work very hard to, 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 to teach kids, and they don't have time to raise somebody else's kids. You've got to be all ready to have this focus when you come in the classroom. You can't come in there with an attitude, uh, well, I don't, I'm not listening today. Sometimes kids' minds are made up, and if your friend don't make it, they don't want to make it. It's almost like, well, they seek out some of the people that would make them feel good about themselves because they're not feeling good about themselves. You know, I heard a thing that says, hurt people hurt people. You ever heard that saying? Sometimes when kids are hurting at home, they bring that negative attitude. And, it, and it, I'm not just talking about anyone here. But the culture we're living in started way back with Hollywood, uh, you know, promoting looks and promoting violence in movies. Then it went from that to the, uh, the games, the, the video games. Kids got on the headphones and they got those things in the ear. Now they're on Facebook. Now they're on all kind of social media. And they seem to gravitate towards being bad because where the good at? Where, where's the good? It's in there. But you need to be educated. Education has a lot to do with it, too, bro. You know, you, it's hard on young people. I understand that. The drugs, the violence, the movies. We didn't have that. We, what we had was family structure. We had good teachers. Teachers that, I bet you, didn't even make $5,000 a year. But they would be right there with us. Our parents would listen. We got spanked, too. Now you can't even hear the kid unless you end up in jail. And if my parents was alive, they would be in jail. They, they would, because they believed in using the paddle. But I'm here. I'm here today because of the, the uh, discipline. You got a discipline. How many of you guys go to church in here? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah? Oh, that's great. That's the root right there. That's what you need right there. When you get the Bible, and I know a lot of schools don't want to hear it, but I'm going to say it because I grew up that way, and it still brings faith to my way of walk. When you get that Bible in you, because you're here for a purpose, 
We're here to love one another, respect each other. We're here to do what's right because it's, it's a natural inerrant that we have to love one another. Nobody wants to be hurt. You'd rather be fed than to be hungry. You'd rather be warm than to be cold. And I tell you one thing, if we all Americans, you let somebody mess with this country, every American in this country is going to be ready to tear out somebody. And that's when we come together, when it's violence. Well, every one of you young people need to stand up for what is right. Justice, truth, righteousness, love, and love conquers everything. It doesn't matter if somebody looks different. It doesn't matter if your eyes are brown or they're blue. It doesn't matter if you have freckles or maybe you might be short or tall. I mean, I've been discriminated. I know what it's like to, to be everything, black, ugly, fat. I've been told all that kind of stuff. But you know what? It's not what you hear. It's what you do with what you hear. OK, so one thing for sure, if we learn to love ourselves, and I think that's a problem with a lot of young people. They don't have the love. Some of them don't even know what it is for somebody to hug them or to say, you know, I'm going to support you today. Or how did you do in school today? They don't hear that. And that's where the problem starts. When it, nobody seen the care, there's no foundation, everybody doing their own thing. You walk out of the house when you get ready. You come home when you get ready. You don't sit at the table and discuss things. And when you do sit at the table, there's a lot of indoctrination going on. Oh, don't talk to that Jewish kid because Jews are this. Don't say nothing to that Puerto Rican. And they sit at the table forming indoctrination. And then kids come to school, and they bring all that negative stuff right to the school because they don't heard the parents sit there and talk about somebody. And when they start talking, say, hey, you know, I don't want to hear that. How do you know this pe person's that way? This is another thing you people, young people can do. Does everybody in here know everyone by name? OK, now when you have a party, is that certain people you invite? Huh? OK, hey, what about this? If you're in a classroom, and you see someone, one of your classmates sitting around, and you're having a party, and you're handing out all these little invitations to certain one, being partial to someone, that's wrong. Don't, be, don't show no partiality toward people. Hey, say, hey, well, how would you like to come to my party? You don't know. That person could have a rapping. He could get there and rap for you, you know, and lighten up the party. He could get there and bring something and say, hey, look, I drew this. We all have talents. We got talents. Let's share them. Let's, let's speak up. Let's look out for one another. Because none of you guys look the same, and none of your fingerprints are the same. So you're different. Yes? So we have about five minutes before they go to lunch. Oh, OK. These, these students from three different schools are going to be able to do just that, have conversations with each other. Right. They're meeting for the first time. I just want to be conscious of the fact that if you've got a burning question that you want you to ask. You better ask me you, now. You better ask her quick. Okay? And then I want you to stand up and sing this song real quick. Got there's a light in all of you. Do you have a question in here? Yes, dear. Can you tell you guys how to do the protest? Pardon me? Can you tell you guys how to protest? How to protest? Who taught you how to protest? How to protest? Oh, well, we was trained during the civil, the civil rights movement. We went to mass meetings. These mass meetings was like a lot of people, you know, and they were leaders, and they told you what we were going to do. They remind us that we're not going to throw rocks. We're not going to do this and that. Stand up, young people, before you all go. Come on, everybody stand up. Everybody has a light inside of them. Everyone has greatness. OK, we're going to sing this song. This little light of mine, come on. This little light of mine. Come on, bring that light out. I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine now. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hey, everywhere I go. 
Hey, now. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine. Okay, now. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Oh. All right. Well, I wanted to say this, young people. Get yourself educated, stay in school, stay away from the drugs and the bullies, anybody the bullies, send them, give them my phone number, I'll talk to them for you. But uh, stay focused on your greatness that you have inside of you. Love, truth, justice, and righteousness. Ain't no time for no fooling around, because we all here for a purpose. And let's make this a better world. You guys are going to be our next leader. Okay? All right. So nice to have you. Thank you so much. Okay, so everyone can have a seat for a second. And then we're going to have, if we can, um, we have a couple Chromebooks out. We just need you to.